Hello, you are listening to Red Menace. My name is Allison, and I am here with my co-host, Brett. And today we are super excited to jump into two texts by a very, very, very important communist theorist, Alexander Kolontai. And we're going to get a little bit into who she is and why these texts matter. But just to kind of start things off, if you haven't checked it out yet, Rev Left Radio has an episode that will get into way more details about Kolontai as a figure that you should absolutely go listen to in order to kind of supplement this. Um, one of the texts, especially that we're looking at here, we were kind of inspired to look at because of the conversation that happened in that episode. So you should definitely go check that out in order to get kind of more depth to what we're going for here. But we have two texts that we're going to look at, one set before the Russian Revolution of 1917 and one set afterwards, which kind of creates an interesting contrast between the two that we hope will be quite useful. Uh, before we kind of get into the details on some of that, our goal also for next month is kind of to mix things up a little bit. Usually we alternate between a theory episode and a current events episode, but sometimes the current events side of things just kind of doesn't fall into place so much and we don't have much to talk about. So to mix it up a little bit, we're going to be doing a QA and a episode next month for the general public. We usually do Q&A episodes for our Patreon, but this time we're going to create a Twitter thread that you'll be able to access just from our Twitter account where you can leave questions from us whether you're a patron or not. And we're going to pick the best of those. There's absolutely no way we'll be able to cover all of them even when we're just getting them from patrons. There's usually way too many to cover, but we'll pick the best of those. And for next month, we will be doing an episode where we get into those questions, wrestle with them, and try to answer them in order to create some engagement between us and you so that we're not just producing the content that we think is interesting, but also answering questions that you have that might be helpful to clarify any of the things we've talked about or just get our thoughts and random things that you're interested in. So definitely be looking forward to that next month. Uh, But for today, we're going to go ahead and dive into these Kolontai texts. Yeah, and I'm really excited to to do a deep dive into the texts themselves. As Allison mentioned, I did an episode with Kristen Godsey on on, uh, Alexandra Kolontai, her biography, her role in the revolution, as well as her contributions to Marxism, feminism, etc. So to get like a really good background on who she was as a historical figure, that episode is particularly helpful. And then I really do also want to plug Kristen Godsey's podcast, AK-47, um, where, over which she goes through 47 texts by Colin Ty, um, reads them and comments on them, has guests come in to sort of have a discussion on them. So if you want to do a deep, deep dive on Colin <laughs> Ty and her work, uh, that podcast is found on, I think, Apple Podcasts, and it's really, really accessible, really interesting. And Kristen Godsey, just with her scholarship and her background knowledge of the history, uh, has a lot of really wonderful and important insights to offer um, on all of those texts by Colin Ty. So it's really, really important. I've been listening to several episodes of AK-47 in preparation for this episode, and I've gotten a lot out of it as well. So definitely check that out. And then, yeah, I just wanted to echo Allison talking about Twitter and um, our Patreon, either on Twitter or on our Patreon. You can go and ask these questions in. We always love interesting, unique ones, you know, questions that come out of left field, questions that aren't the obvious necessarily questions. So if you have some, you know, sort of unique or interesting or out of left field question to ask us, definitely throw that out there and it very well might be might be picked for its novelty. Um, But I'm really looking forward to to that. And and as I was telling Allison before, you know, we could do we could do current events, but it's when it's just some some nonsense about the Biden administration and and there's not a lot happening globally in the sense that we can really tackle it and bring a lot out. Um, It's probably better to do something else and to do something hopefully more productive and informative. So that's what this is an attempt to do. Awesome. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump right into who Colin Tai was and then the summary for these two texts. So first, I want to talk a little bit about who Colin Tai was, um, just to give some context for this. So Alexander Colin Tai was a communist revolutionary born in Russia in 1872, and although she was originally interested in kind of the more populist revolutionary movements in the USSR, she eventually, uh, you know, became influenced and turned to Marxism and joined the RSDLP in 1899. And when the RSDLP had its infamous Bolshevik-Menshevik split in 1903, Kolontai actually originally sided with the Mensheviks. Uh, But despite this sort of earlier decision, when she was kind of confronted with the way that 
revisionist Marxists ended up supporting World War I and some of the right-wing politics among the Mensheviks. She eventually ended up joining the Bolsheviks and uh, really was swayed by the Bolshevik argument in favor of revolutionary defeatism. So instead of participating in World War I, Russia should hope to turn World War I into a war against the Russian state, is what the uh, kind of revolutionary defeatist position was. So Kolontai was a adamant defender of Lenin's ideas during this period of time and really helped rally Bolshevik support behind Lenin's April thesis. She was actually a member of the Bolshevik Central Committee and was present during the vote in which the Bolsheviks decided to overthrow the provisional government following the February Revolution. Following the revolution, she held various roles within Soviet government. She founded the Women's Department, which oversaw the improvement of women's lives within the USSR. And the Women's Department was crucial in pushing literacy rights, rights for women within marriage, and the legalization of abortion. As time went on, um, you know, she kind of fell out of favor, actually, and she began to side with critics within the Soviet Union, eventually helping to found the workers' opposition. And this ended up putting her at odds with Lenin, which really hurt her political career. She was an adamant critic of right-wing positions within the Soviet Union, and in particular, a lot of the fight with Lenin came over her very strong attacks against the new economic policy. So due in part to her political opposition and the effects that that had, Kolontai eventually went abroad to serve as a Soviet diplomat to several different countries. Eventually, she went and retired back in the USSR, dropping a lot of her criticism during the time of Stalin. She was one of the Bolsheviks who actually made it through the purges that occurred within the party, and Kolontai died having retired and become sadly quite politically obscure in 1952 in the USSR. So that's a little bit about who she is. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into one of her texts real quick. And the first one that we're going to look at is called On the Social Basis of the Woman Question. This is a text written in 1909 that is sort of a polemic against feminism of the time, and also an argument that those feminists who would, you know, want to pursue these ideas of women's liberation need to do so through the Communist Party and through communist organizing. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, so Kolontai starts this essay with a little bit of an introduction, and she opens by rebuking sort of bourgeois biological understandings of women's oppression. So she kind of sets her sights first on the bourgeoisie themselves and how they often understand women. And she insists that if we want to understand the position and experience of women in society, we can't be bothered by looking at women's biology for an explanation, but rather we need to look at the economic factors that women exist within. She writes, quote, the followers of historical materialism reject the existence of a special woman question, separate from the general social question of our day. Specific economic factors were behind the subordination of women. Natural qualities have been a secondary factor in this process. Only the complete disappearance of these factors, only the evolution of those factors, which at some point in the past gave rise to the subjection of women, is able in a fundamental way to influence and change their social positions. In other words, women cannot become truly free and equal except in a world organized along new social and productive lines. End quote. So let's think about what's going on here. Here, she rejects the idea that there's a distinct woman question separate from the social question of class more broadly. And this idea runs throughout and animates her argument in this essay. And I think up front, we need to consider this quote quite carefully. Kolontai does not state that there is no experiences or conditions which are unique to women in some way or another. And in fact, she recognizes that there is kind of a specific subjection of women but she insists that the question of this subjection is not distinct from the question of class. So let's try to wrestle with this for a second so that we don't risk misunderstanding this argument. What exactly does this mean? What does it mean to say there's no special or separate question of women's subjection beyond class? For Kolontai, the particular and specific subjection of women is not non-existent. It's clearly there. So how does this function? And this is not really the meaning of her claim, right? She's not trying to argue that women don't face particular unique problems. As will become clear in this text, a desire to address these problems and this subjection is actually really something that she cares about a lot and is not what she's trying to push back against. When she argues that there's no special or separate question, Kolontai is arguing that the subjection of women cannot be understood independently of class considerations or, and this is important, as a substitute for class analysis. 
This distinction is important to understand because there are certain chauvinists who read this text as a rejection of all possible insights of feminism. And while Kolontai is certainly highly dismissive of the feminist movement of her time, she's not rejecting insights regarding the specificity of women's subjection, so much as the idea that this specificity would lead to a whole new project separate from class struggle or even oppositional to class struggle on the basis of cross-class solidarity among women. Kolontai quickly follows the rejection of a special woman question by insisting that women's lives can still be somewhat improved through reforms, just as workers have won moderate gains through reforms as well. Still, this really is tempered by the fact that reforms cannot overcome the conditions which are at the core of women's subjection. She goes on to insist that the biggest champions of women's emancipation have been the communists, and she insists that it is only the communists who have made women's emancipation a programmatic aspect of their political goals as part of their broader struggle against class society. So given this reality, Kolontai asks why it is that so many of the feminists of her time reject the communist position and refuse to join communist parties who are clearly struggling for women's own liberation. And she ultimately concludes that this is because much of the feminist movement is led by bourgeois women whose interests are not in fact proletarian in nature. She writes, quote, The feminists seek equality in the framework of the existing class society. In no way do they attack the basis of this society. They fight for prerogatives for themselves, without challenging the existence of prerogatives and privileges. We do not accuse the representative of the bourgeois women's movement of failure to understand the matter. Their view of things flows inevitably from their class position." End quote. And so, for Kolontai, part of the problem is that the feminist movement of her time is not seeking to overthrow the state of things, but rather to gain the privileges that that current society confers on some people. And obviously this would be an untenable position for a Marxist to endorse. So, having kind of given her introduction and set up the basic outlines of her critique of the feminist movement, Kolontai then sets up a section called the struggle for economic independence. And Kolontai begins the, uh, this kind of first proper section of the text by tackling a basic question. In her words, quote, First of all, we must ask ourselves whether a single united women's movement is possible in a society based on class contradictions. The fact that women who take part in the liberation movement do not represent one homogenous mass is clear to every single unbiased observer. End quote. Kolontai argues then that there are two camps within the broader women's movement who have oppositional ends in mind. These are bourgeois women and proletarian women. Both of these groups operate under the unity of the slogans of women's liberation, but Kolontai insists and really pushes the idea that these slogans mostly paper over fundamentally diverging interests. Class, Kolontai insists, is fundamental in dictating a person's self-interest, and despite the better intentions of bourgeois feminists, their actual actions will always be taken from a bourgeois position. There may be overlap in terms of proletarian and bourgeois women within certain specific short-term struggles, but over a long-term struggle, there's fundamental divergences that Kolontai tells us will make themselves known. She writes, quote, while well, for the feminists, the achievement of equal rights with men in the framework of the contemporary capitalist world represents a sufficiently concrete end in itself, equal rights at the present time are, for the proletarian woman, only a means of advancing the struggle against the economic slavery of the working class. The feminist sees men as the main enemy, for men have unjustly seized all rights and privileges for themselves, leaving women only chains and duties. For them, a victory is won when a prerogative previously enjoyed exclusively by the male sex is conceded to the fair sex. Proletarian women have a different attitude. They do not see men as the enemy and the oppressor. On the contrary, they think of some men as their comrades who share them, with them the drudgery of the daily round and fight with them for a better future. The woman and her male comrade are enslaved by the same social conditions. The same hated chains of capitalism oppresses their will and deprives them of joys and charms of life. It is true that several specific aspects of the contemporary system lie with double weight upon women, as it is also true that the conditions of hired labor sometimes turn women into competitors and rivals to men. But in these unfavorable situations, the working class knows who is guilty." End quote. <laughs> 
So for Colin Ty, the problem within the feminist movement over time is thus that it treats the question of women's liberation as fundamentally distinct from class struggle and replaces the bourgeoisie with the, as the enemy with men broadly as the enemy in some sense or another. And this is a mistake, Colin Ty insists, because working women face particular forms of exploitation on the basis of their class, of being proletarians. And so to ignore class, to ignore the way that bourgeois women can participate in class society, is to ignore a fundamental source of part of what she calls the double oppression of women. And this is not due to kind of a misunderstanding of the terrain struggle that the bourgeois feminists kind of get this wrong, but it's rather a result of kind of the inclusion of bourgeois women within the leadership of the movement. It's not possible for these two classes to unite in opposition to women's oppression, according to Colin Ty. And furthermore, the bourgeois women can obscure the consciousness of proletarian women through the idea of a cross-class gender-based coalition. And this ultimately hurts proletarian women because it hinders the revolutionary class class struggle, which might actually benefit proletarian women by destroying the economic conditions which produce women's subjection. Kolontai again writes that, quote, a woman can possess equal rights and be truly free only in a world of socialized labor, of harmony and justice. The feminists are unwilling and incapable of understanding this. It seems to them that when equality is formally accepted by the letter of the law, they will be able to win a comfortable place for themselves in the old world of oppression, enslavement, bondage, of tears, and hardships. And this is true up to a certain point. For the majority of women of the proletariat, equal rights with men would mean only an equal share in inequality, but for the chosen few, for the bourgeois women. It would until now have been enjoyed by men of the bourgeois class alone, but each new concession won by the bourgeois woman would give her yet another weapon for the exploitation of her younger sister, and would go on increasing the division between the women of the two opposite social camps. Their interests would be more sharply in conflict, their aspirations more obviously in contradiction. And so the idea that is important here that Colin Tai is really pushing is that the idea of rights within the existing capitalist system is meaningless for the proletarian woman who does not have rights even when the law recognizes them. Capitalism has always had a de facto system of exploitation that operates perfectly legally, and the liberal notion of rights has never been enough to secure the well-being of anyone other than the capitalists themselves. And so Kolontai answers her opening question of whether or not there can be a unified cross-class women's movement with a resounding no. Having answered this question in the abstract, she turns to considering the historical development of the women's movement of her time, and she insists that the middle-class feminists have developed a thoroughly bourgeois outlook that has ignored the particular experiences of proletarian women. And we'll quote her at length here so you can kind of get a sense of what she's saying. She explains that, quote, the woman question assumed importance for women of the bourgeois class approximately in the middle of the 19th century, a considerable time after the proletarian women had arrived in the labor arena. Under the impact of the monstrous successes of capitalism, the middle class of the population were hit by waves of need. The economic changes had rendered the financial solution of the petty and middle bourgeoisie unstable, and the bourgeois women were faced with a dilemma of menacing proportions, either accept poverty or achieve the right to work. Wives and daughters of these social groups began to knock at the doors of the universities, the art salons, the editorial houses, the offices, flooding to the professions that were open to them. The desire of bourgeois women to gain access to science and the higher benefits of culture was not the result of a sudden maturing need, but stemmed from that same question of daily bread. The women of the bourgeoisie met from the very first with stiff resistance from men. A stubborn battle was waged between the professional men, attached to their cozy little jobs, and women who were novices in this matter of earning their daily bread. This struggle gave rise to feminism, the attempt of bourgeois women to stand together and pit their common strength against the enemy, against men. As they entered the labor arena, these women proudly referred to themselves as the vanguard of the women's movement. They forgot that in this matter of winning economic independence, they were, as in other fields, traveling in the footsteps of their younger sisters and reaping the fruits and efforts of their blistered hands.
So for Colin Ty, part of the problem with the feminist movement of her time as it exists is that these demands for economic independence that bourgeois women are making about wanting to be able to enter jobs where they see themselves as the vanguards for trying to get into these professions ignore the fact that proletarian women have been working for some time at this point. They have been pushed into workforces for jobs that no one would want. And so the perspective of the feminist movement at the time ignores these proletarian perspectives, which in many ways, Kolontai argues, have actually paved the way for the bourgeois movement to exist at all. So having discussed the question of economic independence, she sets up her next section, which is called Marriage and the Problem of the Family. So she next turns to another important question that stands out within both Marxist and feminist struggle, and that is the question of the family. She insists that if we want to understand the subjection of women, we have to look beyond abstract notions of political equality and instead wrestle with, quote, the heavy chains of the current forms of the family, which are outmoded and oppressive. For women, the solution of the family question is no less important than the achievement of political equality and economic independence, end quote. So women, according to Colin Tai, face a particular form of oppression within the family. The demands placed on wives and mothers are themselves a particular sort of burden, which has been instated both into law as well as social norms, which enforce women's subservience. And she acknowledges that this form of oppression does affect women in every single class. So, you know, maybe this could be the point where unity comes from. She writes that bourgeois society crushes women with its savage economic vice, paying her uh, for her labor at a very low rate. The woman is deprived of the citizen's right to raise her voice in defense of her interests, Instead, she is given only the gracious alternative of the bondage of marriage or the embraces of prostitution, a trade despised and persecuted in public, but encouraged and supported in secret. It is necessary to emphasize the dark sides of the contemporary married life and the suffering women experienced in connection with their position in the present family structure. So much has already been written and said on this subject. Literature is full of depressing pictures of the snares of married and family life. How many psychological dramas are enacted? How many lives are crippled? Here, it is only important for us to note that the modern family structure, to a lesser or greater extent, oppresses women of all classes and all layers of the population. Customs and traditions persecute the young mother, whatever the stratum of the population to which she belongs. And the law places bourgeois women, proletarian women, and peasant women all under the guardianship of their husbands. Kolontai then asks whether or not uh, this sort of cross-class oppression, which comes from the structure of the family, uh, can be a basis for solidarity between women of different classes. And unsurprisingly, and very much in line with her theses throughout this text, she rejects this idea. The bourgeois feminists, she argues, have not sought to actually change the conditions which produce the family, but rather to create individualist and subjective forms of resistance. The feminist movement has latched on to a romantic notion of heroic womanhood, defying the expectations placed on them at the individual level. And this form of defiance is understood as a revolutionary structure against the family and patriarchy itself. But such ideas of free love or of radical living obscure the economic factors and the conditions behind the family and instead shift the focus to the subjective experiences of individual women. Again, she writes, quote, is free love possible? Can it be realized as a common phenomena, as the general accepted norm rather than the individual exception given the economic structure of our society? Is it possible to ignore the elements of private property in contemporary marriage? Is it possible in an individualistic world to ignore the formal marriage contract without damaging the interests of women? For the marital contract is the only guarantee that all the difficulties in maternity will not fall on the woman alone. Will not that which once happened to the male worker now happen to the woman? The removal of guild regulations, without the establishment of new rules governing the conduct of the masters, gave capital absolute power over the workers. The tempting slogan, freedom of contract for labor and capital, became a means for the naked exploitation of labor by capitalism. Free love, introduced consistently into contemporary class society, instead of freeing women from the hardships of family life, would surely shoulder her with a new burden, the task of caring alone and unaided for her children, end quote. It is here that we can see the importance of Colin Tai's argument. It is not merely that the demands of the bourgeois women fail to meet the needs of the proletarian women. That would be unfortunate. 
but it would not be a danger to the proletarian women struggling for freedom, necessarily. The situation is worse than this. Kolontai argues that the forms of individualist resistance formulated under the title of free love can actually harm working women. The concept of freedom that undergirds free love is similar, according to Kolontai, to the concept of freedom that was removed whatever protections the guild system had for workers in order to allow for more free exploitation of the proletariat. Furthermore, a libertine notion of free love could form the basis of sexual exploitation of working women by bosses and men of the ruling class. So such an ideology thus is not only useless for the working woman, but could be harmful if it were ever actually materially instituted in some meaningful way. And so Kolontai thus quips, quote, As women go out to work and achieve economic independence, certain possibilities for free love appear, particularly for the better paid women of the intelligentsia. But the dependence of women on capital remains, and this dependence increases as more and more proletarian women sell their labor power. Is the slogan free love capable of improving the sad existence of these women who earn only just enough to keep themselves alive? And anyway, is it not free love already practiced among the working classes and practiced so widely that the bourgeoisie are on more than one occasion raised to alarm and campaign against the depravity and the immorality of the proletariat? So again, she really emphasizes this criticism of the notion of free love, which will be contrasted somewhat with her ideas in the next essay that we're going to look at. So in light of the failures of an abstract notion of free love, many feminists of Kolontai's time also turned to a notion of developing new family structures in order to create new modes of relating. And these attempts are, of course, limited by the existence of a capitalist system of production and property, which ultimately can't be overcome by developing new forms of kinship. Kolontai explains this very well. She writes, The feminists and the social reformers from the camp of the bourgeoisie naively believe in the possibility of creating new forms of family and new types of marital relations against the dismal background of the contemporary class society, tie themselves into knot in search of these new forms. If life itself has not yet produced these forms, it is necessary, they seem to imagine, to think them up, whatever the cost. There must, they believe, be modern forms of sexual relationships which are capable of solving the complex family problem under the present social system. And the ideologists of the bourgeois world, the journalists, writers, and prominent women fighters for emancipation, one after another, put forward their family uh, panacea or their new formula. How utopian these marriage formulas sound, how feeble these palliatives when considered in the light of the gloomy reality of our modern family structure. Before these formulas of free relationships and free love can become practice, it is above all necessary that a fundamental reform to all social relationships between people take place. And furthermore, the moral and sexual norms of the whole psychology of mankind would have to undergo a thorough revolution. Is the contemporary person psychologically able to cope with free love? What about the jealousy that eats into even the best human souls and that deeply rooted sense of property? that demands the possession, not only of the body, but of the soul of another." End quote. Thus, the solution to the family can't be found in any sort of lifestyle politics for Colin Ty. She's pushing back against kind of all of those. Any politics which just seeks to change the way we live under capitalism is a form of reformism that is due to fail. And so this form of politics, it cannot challenge the economic base of the family structure at all. Working and bourgeois women were attracted to these feminist critiques of the family structure for very obvious reasons. The family structure is a problem, it produces a particular oppression of women, but it can only be overcome through the defeat of the bourgeois class. And that means a defeat of bourgeois women as well. And as such, although women of all classes suffer under the family structure, the family structure can never be defeated through cross-class solidarity among all women, according to Colin Ty. Rather, the interests of proletarian women as proletarians must be the mechanism for overcoming the family structure. And only the collective struggle of the workers against capitalism and class society could ever pave the road for this. Colin Ty summarizes her ending of this section, writing, quote, with the transfer of educational functions from the family to society, the last tie holding together the modern isolated family will be loosened. The process of disintegration will proceed at an even faster pace, and the pale silhouette of future marital relations will begin to emerge. What can we say about these indistinct silhouettes? 
hidden as they are by the present-day influences. Does one have to repeat that the present compulsory form of marriage will be replaced by the free union of loving individuals? The ideal of free love drawn by the hungry imagination of women fighting for their emancipation undoubtedly corresponds to some extent to the norm of relationships between the sexes that society will establish. However, the social influences are so complex and their interactions so diverse that it is impossible to foretell what the relationships of the future, when the whole system has fundamentally changed, will be like. But the slowly maturing evolution of relations between the sexes is clear evidence that ritual marriage and the compulsive isolated family are doomed to disappear." End quote. And so Colin Ty tells us that although we cannot know the specifics of it, what is clear is that as we move into socialism and as we move into communism, there will be a change, but that change can only be changed if we get rid of the economic realities of capitalism that create women's subjugation. So in a final section titled The Struggle for Political Rights, Kolontai finishes her essay by again asking whether or not a cross-class solidarity of women is possible. She says that feminists uh, argue that even if their goals are limited to the communist perspective, they are still worthwhile goals. So even if it is just reformism, are they not reforms that we want? Why then can there not be an alliance between the communist movement and the feminist movement of Kolontai's time? And Kolontai concludes by answering this question, and we will have one more lengthy quote here before we are done with our summary. So she writes, quote, the feminists declare themselves to be on the side of social reform, and some of them even say they are in favor of socialism, in the far distant future, of course, but they are not interested to struggle in the ranks of the working class for the realization of these aims. The best of them believe with a naive sincerity that once the deputies' seats are within their reach, they will be able to cure the social sores, which have, in their view, developed because of men, with their inherent egotism, have been masters of the situation." However, however good the intentions of individual groups of feminists towards the proletariat, whenever the question of class struggle has been posed, they have left the battlefield in a fright. They find that they do not wish to interfere in alien causes and prefer to retire to their bourgeois liberalism, which is so comfortably familiar. No, however much the bourgeois feminist tries to repress the true aims of their political desire, however much they assure their younger sisters that involvement in political life promises immeasurable benefits to women of the working class, the bourgeois spirit that pervades the whole feminist movement gives a class coloring even to the demand for equal political rights with men, which would seem to be a general women's demand. Different aims and understandings of political rights are to be used to create an unbridgeable gulf between the bourgeois and proletarian women. This does not contradict the fact that the immediate task of the two groups of women coincide to a certain degree, for the representatives of all classes which have received access to political power strive above all to achieve a review of the civil code, which in every country to a greater or lesser extent discriminates against women. Women press for legal changes that create more favorable conditions of labor for themselves. They stand together against the regulations legalizing prostitution, etc. However, the coincidence of these, um, of these immediate tasks is of a purely formal nature, for class interest determines that the attitude of the two groups to these reforms is sharply contradictory. Class instinct, whatever the feminists say, always shows itself to be the more powerful than the noble enthusiasm of above-class politics. So long as the bourgeois women and their younger sisters are equal in their inequality, the former can with complete sincerity make great efforts to defend the general interests of women. But once the barrier is down and the bourgeois women have received access to political activity, the recent defenders of the rights of all women become enthusiastic defenders of the privileges of their class content to leave their younger sisters with no rights at all, end quote. And so this is how Kolontai concludes this essay, which is quite scathing in its criticism. So now I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Brett, who's going to take us to an essay written a little bit later on historically that will have some interesting parallels with this one. Okay, so for my essay, I am covering Alexandra Kolontai's 1923 essay, Make Way for Winged Eros, A Letter to the Working Youth. And just for some context before we dive into the, the substance of the essay, this is written at, in the last days of the Russian Civil War, right? 1923 is when that Russian Civil War ends. So you have the October Revolution, 
you have the the sort of implementation of Bolshevism, then you have the international reaction and attempt to squash it and eradicate it. The Bolsheviks and the Red Army come out victorious, and then you have now the template set to begin to create this new socialist society, this new working class state. And it's in that context that Kalantai is writing. So with Allison's essay, uh, she was writing before the Russian Civil War. And in this essay, she's writing afterwards. And it's interesting, as Allison alluded to, to see how the focus shifts and the emphasis shifts given these different historical moments in which she's writing. Um, it's also important to know that at this time, uh, Kalantai is well in, I think, in her early 50s. So she's aiming this letter to the working youth, right, sort of as a stand-in for this younger generation of revolutionaries coming out of the Civil War, you know, questioning everything about the society, including love and relationships and how they should interact with others in this new this new world created by the, the Bolshevik Revolution. And so it's important to understand that she's in that part of her life. And of course, for those that don't know, Eros is the Greek god of love and sex, and that's where this this sort of metaphor of winged eros and wingless eros comes out of is playing on this ancient Greek uh, mythology, this this figure of, of Greek mythology. So that is the context, and she breaks this essay up into three sections. The first one is called Love as a Socio-Psychological Factor. The second one is called Historical Notes. And the third one is called Love Comradeship. So I will also break it down by these sections because she's doing slightly different things in these sections, all in the service, of course, of a broader argument. So Colin Ty starts off this first section by framing this essay, as I said, as a dialogue between herself and her quote-unquote young friend, which is just a stand-in for the younger generation of, of revolutionaries in Soviet Russia. She says she is attempting to find an explanation for the fact that some are concerned that young workers seem to be more occupied with love and relationships than with the enormous tasks of building socialism in the wake of the Russian Civil War. She aims in this part to explain why that is and then move later into a historical materialist analysis of love under different modes of production and social relations. And then at the end, she outlines what a future socialist conception of love could be. So starting with an analysis of the present situation, the tail end of the Russian Civil War, in which the Bolsheviks have all but won, she argues that the conflict between the bourgeoisie and proletariat are not just about politics and economics, but also about culture, about outlook, about the inner lives of workers. New attitudes towards society, work, art, and morality are beginning to emerge and change the way that men and women think about themselves, others, and their futures. The riddle of love, as she calls it, is among the things being rethought and wrestled with. Quote, The riddle of love that interests us here is one such problem. This question of the relationships between the sexes is a mystery as old as human society itself. At different levels of historical development, humankind has approached the solution of this problem in different ways. The problem remains the same. The keys to its solution change. The keys are fashioned by the different epochs, by the classes in power, and by the spirit of a particular age, which is to say, by its culture. She goes on to assert that over the recent years, as Russian society has been immersed in a brutal civil war with everything at stake, interests and questions such as love have fallen to the wayside. As the working class has had to put all of its time, its energy, and its passions into the defense of the revolution and against the international forces of reaction and oppression. Under such circumstances, sex was reduced more or less to biological and reproductive necessity, with men and women coming together and parting, quote, without great commitment and without tears or regret, end quote. Kalantai goes on, quote, Prostitution disappeared, and the number of sexual relationships where the partners were under no obligation to each other and which were based on the instinct of reproduction unadorned by any emotions of love increased. This fact frightened some. But such a development was, in those years, inevitable. Either pre-existing relationships continued to exist and unite men and women through comradeship and long-standing friendship, which was rendered more precious by the seriousness of the moment, 
or new relationships were begun for the satisfaction of purely biological needs, both partners treating the affair as incidental and avoiding any commitment that might hinder their work for the revolution. The unadorned sexual drive is easily aroused but is soon spent. Thus, wingless eros consumes less inner strength than winged eros." End quote. Now, by wingless eros here, Kalantai means sexual relationships that are largely casual, shallow, and lacking emotional attachment or depth. Today, we might call it something like hookup culture. By winged eros, Kalantai is referring to the full experience of love, of romantic infatuation, of sexual and romantic relationships shot through with meaning and connection, buzzing with intensity. During the fraught years of the revolution and subsequent civil war, it was wingless eros that dominated. But as the civil war winds down and the task of building a new world comes to the fore, Kalantai reminds us that the duty of the proletariat does not merely lie in the creation of a new political and economic system, but also in a revolution of the inner life, of the psychological and the cultural. To those who reduce socialism to productive forces and objective class structures, this inclusion by Kalantai of the rest of human life into the socialist project must have seemed fanciful. But to me, it represents an early and fascinating prelude to the conception of a cultural revolution. In any case, Kalantai goes on, quote, now that the revolution has proved victorious and is in a stronger position, and now that the atmosphere of revolutionary alone has ceased to absorb men and women completely, tender winged Eros has emerged from the shadows and begun to demand his rightful place. Wingless Eros has ceased to satisfy psychological needs. Emotional energy has accumulated, and men and women, even of the working class, have not yet learned to use it for the inner life of the collective. This extra energy seeks an outlet in the love experience. The many-stringed lyre of the god of love drowns the monotonous voice of wingless arrows. Men and women are now not only united by the momentary satisfaction of the sex instinct, but are beginning to experience love affairs again, and to know all the sufferings and all the exaltations of love's happiness. End quote. In this new period for the Soviet Republic, all the dimensions of life are beginning to reassert themselves and be reconsidered in a new light. The intellectual, emotional, artistic, psychological, and sociocultural needs of the people are, Kalantai argues, part and parcel of the revolution, not something separate from it. She then makes an even more interesting claim. She says that love is not a personal, private matter, but is profoundly and fundamentally a social phenomenon. Quote, it is time to recognize openly that love is not only a powerful natural factor, a biological force, but also a social factor. Essentially, love is a profoundly social emotion. At all stages of human development, love has, in different forms, it is true, been an integral part of culture. Even the bourgeoisie, who saw love as a private matter, were able to channel the expression of love in its class interests. The ideology of the working class must pay even greater attention to the significance of love as a factor which can, like any other psychological or social phenomenon, be channeled to the advantage of the collective. Love is not in the least a private matter concerning only the two loving persons. Love possesses a uniting element which is valuable to the collective. After that first section, she then moves on to the section entitled Historical Notes, in which she will attempt to do a historical materialist account of our emotional and romantic lives. So the next section of this essay, entitled, as I said, Historical Notes, is nothing less than that, an historical materialist account of love over the history of human society. She starts this section by saying, quote, From the very early stages of its social being, humanity has sought to regulate not only sexual relations, but love itself. End quote. Kalantai starts, as any good historical materialist must, in the ancient world. She argues that in that social context, when humanity was transitioning from tribal kinship communities in which love between members of the tribe was held in the highest esteem toward larger collectives and city-states, it was close, loyal friendships which were encouraged and admired because they acted as a stabilizing glue for the new emerging societies. 
as societies grew beyond their tiny tribal forms into new, larger forms, these contacts and relationships between members of these new societies were crucial. But since these societies were also patriarchal, it was friendship amongst men specifically that was cherished, even above the relationships between men and women in marriage. In fact, men offering their wives sexually to acquaintances or guests or friends was common, as male bonds were more important than marriage bonds. Kalantai goes on, quote, The ancient world considered friendship and loyalty until the grave to be civic virtues. Love in the modern sense of the word had no place and hardly attracted the attention either of poets or of writers. The dominant ideology of that time relegated love to the sphere of narrow personal experiences with which society was not concerned. Marriage was based on convenience, not on love. Love was just one among other amusements. It was a luxury which only the citizen who had fulfilled all his obligations to the state could possibly afford. While bourgeois ideology values the ability to love, provided it confines itself to the limits set down by bourgeois morality, the ancient world did not consider such emotions in its categories of virtues and positive human qualities. The person who accomplished great deeds and risked his life for his friend was considered a hero and his action most virtuous, while a man risking himself for the sake of a woman he loved would have been reproached or even despised." End quote. So at different stages of cultural development, the prominent place of male friendships withered away and were eventually replaced by other relationships. For example, in bourgeois society, there is little need for friendship as a vaunted relationship because rabid individualism and hyper-competition are needed to maintain bourgeois class society. As an aside, this is probably a major reason why so many people, even in the age of social media, are plagued by loneliness and have fewer and fewer close relationships as late capitalism intensifies and bursts asunder all social ties that are not relevant to its continued devouring of the planet. It is probably also related to the weakening of men's friendships with one another, which, for the past century at least, have been kneecapped and hindered by the threat of homoeroticism, as if forming close, affectionate, loving friendships with other men was somehow weak, feminine, or otherwise suspect. The term no homo is the perfect encapsulation of this anxiety, but we shall return to the deformities of bourgeois society in a bit. For now, Kalantai moves on to relationships under feudalism. In the feudal system, where society was split between nobility and the peasant classes, the family began to eclipse male friendship as the dominant relationship in society. Obligations of the individual to his or her family and its traditions and lineage became paramount, and marriage was merely a contract between families, more so than it was a loving relationship between men and women. In fact, marrying for love and out of one's free will instead of out of one's familial obligation was seen as a sin and a disgrace to the family. Kalantai notes, quote, Nevertheless, love between the sexes was not neglected. In fact, for the first time in the history of humanity, it received a certain recognition. It may seem strange that love was first accepted in this age of strict asceticism, of crude and cruel morals, an age of violence and rule by violence, but the reasons for acceptance become clear when we take a closer look. In certain situations, and in certain circumstances, love can act as a lever propelling the man to perform actions of which he would otherwise have been incapable. The knighthood demanded of each member fearlessness, bravery, endurance, and great feats of individual valor on the battlefield. Victory in war was, in those days, decided not so much by the organization of troops as by the individual qualities of the participants. The knight in love with the inaccessible lady of his heart found it easier to perform miracles of bravery, easier to win tournaments, easier to sacrifice his own life. The knight in love was motivated by the desire to shine and thus to win the attention of his beloved. She goes on, The ideology of chivalry recognized love as a psychological state that could be used to the advantage of the feudal class, but nevertheless it sought to organize emotions in a definite framework. Love between man and wife was not valued. The social factor of chivalrous love operated such that the knight loved a woman outside the family and was inspired to military and other heroic feats by this emotion. The more inaccessible the woman, 
the greater the knight's determination to win her favor, i.e., the greater his need to develop in himself the virtues and qualities which were valued by his social class. Usually the knight chose as his lady the woman least accessible, the wife of a man much higher in status, or often even the queen herself. Only such a platonic love could spur the knight to perform miracles of bravery and was considered virtuous and worthy. The knight rarely chose an unmarried woman as his object for his love, for no matter how far above him in station and apparently inaccessible the girl might be, the possibility of marriage and the consequent removal of the psychological lever could not be allowed. Hence, feudal morality combined recognition of the ideal of asceticism, sexual restraint, with recognition of love as a moral virtue. In his desire to free love from all that was carnal and sinful and to transform it into an abstract emotion completely divorced from its biological basis, the knight was prepared to go to great lengths, choosing as his lady a woman he had never seen or joining the ranks of the lovers of the Virgin Mary. Further, he could not go." End quote. Under feudalism, then, we see love between a man and a woman be totally divorced from marriage, be platonic in nature, and be so separate from sex and carnality as to be merely a reified abstraction, a platonic, in both senses of the word, ideal, and nothing more. Still, the seed of what we today know as romantic love was present and would later blossom if under strict moral confines and limitations. In the 21st century, those confines are being increasingly contested in new and exciting ways, which we'll talk about in section 2. But I digress. The point here is that feudal ideology saw love as a stimulus to serve the interests of the noble class. A knight going to war and giving it his all in defense of his banners and noble family because of his adoration of the queen, for example, clearly served the interests of the ruling class under feudalism, and so it was admired and reified into a virtue. Kollontai says that, quote, the knight who would have thought nothing of sending his own wife to a monastery or of killing her for unfaithfulness would have been flattered if she had been chosen by another knight as his lady, end quote. In this way, love and marriage were totally separate things under feudalism and would only be united by the bourgeois class that eventually emerged centuries ago. At this time, though, sex both within and without the marriage lacked the element of love and tenderness often associated with it today and was largely seen and experienced as a naked physiological act. The same knight who would write poetry to his lady and risk his own life to win just her smile would also, as Kollontai points out, rape a peasant girl without a second thought and discard her when he was satisfied sexually. Having covered love and relationships in tribal societies, ancient city-states, and then feudalism, Kollontai now turns toward capitalism. Quote, With the weakening of feudalism and the growth of new conditions of life dictated by the interests of the rising bourgeoisie, a new moral ideal of relations between the sexes developed. Rejecting platonic love, the bourgeoisie defended the violated rights of the body and injected the combination of the spiritual and physical into the very conception of love. Bourgeois morality did not separate love and marriage. Marriage was the expression of the mutual attraction of the couple. In practice, of course, the bourgeoisie itself, in the name of convenience, continually sinned against this moral teaching, but the recognition of love as the pillar of marriage had a profound class basis. She goes on, Under the feudal system, the family was held together firmly by the traditions of nobility and birth. The married couple was held in place by the power of the church, the unlimited authority of the head of the family, the strength of family tradition, etc. Marriage was indissoluble. The bourgeois family evolved in different conditions. Its basis was not the co-ownership of family wealth, but the accumulation of capital. The family was the guardian of this capital. In order that accumulation might take place as rapidly as possible, it was important that a man's savings should be handled with care and skill. In other words, that the woman should not only be a good housewife, but also the helper and friend of her husband. With the establishment of capitalist relations and of the bourgeois social system, the family, in order to remain stable, had to be based not only on economic considerations, but also on the cooperation of all of its members, who had a joint interest in the accumulation of wealth. And cooperation could serve as a more powerful factor when husband and wife and parents and children were held together by strong emotional and psychological bonds. End quote. 
The rise of the bourgeoisie brought with it a mocking of the spiritual love and chivalry of the night and combined for the first time on a social scale sex and love, physical attraction and emotional attachment. Love and marriage were no longer two distinct things, but united as one. This is all fine and dandy, but as Kalantai points out, in practice, as with so many things, the bourgeoisie retreated from its ideals to a less savory reality. We have all seen, for example, loveless marriages, kept together for religious or economic reasons, while both partners suffer needlessly but try to present themselves as if they were still happy and in love. Moreover, what is considered love under bourgeois rule has always been very narrow and constrained. For the vast majority of capitalism's existence, love and sex were only acceptable within marriages, specifically within marriages between a man and a woman. Such ideas, as Kalantai makes clear, were often dictated by underlying economic conditions, for example, by the desire to prevent the distribution of inherited capital among illegitimate children. Kalantai argues, quote, the entire morality of the bourgeoisie was directed towards the concentration of capital. The ideal was the married couple, working together to improve their welfare and to increase the wealth of their particular family unit, divorced as it was from society. Where the interests of the family and society were in conflict, bourgeois morality decided in the interests of the family. This morality, with a utilitarianism typical of the bourgeoisie, tried to use love to its advantage, making it the main ingredient of marriage and thereby strengthening the family. Love, of course, could not be contained within the limits set down by bourgeois ideologists. Emotional conflicts grew and multiplied and found their expression in the new form of literature, the novel, which the bourgeois class developed. Love constantly escaped from the narrow framework of legal marriage relations set for it into free relationships and adultery, which were condemned but which were openly practiced. The bourgeois ideal of love does not correspond to the needs of the largest section of the population, the working class, end quote. Before moving on to the last section, Colin Tai asserts that this brief survey of the evolution of love and relationships is intended to help us understand that love is not a private matter, that it is an essential social factor, and it is something that societies have always attempted to organize in their own interests. She implores us, quote, Working men and women, armed with the science of Marxism and using the experience of the past, must seek to discover the place love ought to occupy in the new social order and determine the ideal of love that corresponds to their class interests. End quote. Now Kalantai moves on to the last section of her essay entitled Love Comradeship, in which she elucidates her conception of proletarian love, of a new way of being and relating and loving one another in a new society. So Kalantai opens the last section of the essay with an assertion that the new communist society is being built on the principles of comradeship and solidarity, and that solidarity, far from being merely an awareness of common interests, depends on the emotional ties of members of the collective. These ties must be undergirded with love. Not, of course, the romantic or sexual love described above, but the broader sense of love rooted in genuine care and concern for the other, as well as a deep recognition of the individual's relationship to the collective and thus to other individuals within that collective. Just as the bourgeoisie used love for its ideological domination, the proletariat must too take love seriously, but this time in service of collective solidarity. Kalantai then asks us, what is this proletarian ideal of love? We know, as she has sketched out, that each epoch has its own ideals and goals and uses love to suit its own interests. So at the dawning of this new epoch, the epoch of socialism and eventually communism, it is our duty to do the same. Kalantai says, quote, In the course of the thousand-year history of human society, Love has developed from the simple biological instinct, the urge to reproduce which is inherent in all creatures from the highest to the lowest, into a most complex emotion that is constantly acquiring new intellectual and emotional aspects. Love has become a psychological and social factor. Under the impact of economic and social forces, the biological instinct for reproduction has been transformed into two diametrically opposed directions. 
On the one hand, the healthy sexual instinct has been turned by monstrous social and economic relations, particularly those of capitalism, into unhealthy carnality. The sexual act has become an aim in itself, just another way of obtaining pleasure through lust sharpened with excesses and through distorted, harmful titillations of the flesh. A man does not have sex in response to healthy instincts which have drawn him to a particular woman. A man approaches any woman, though he feels no sexual need for her in particular, with the aim of gaining his sexual satisfaction and pleasure through her. Prostitution is the organized expression of this distortion of the sex drive. If intercourse with the woman does not prompt the expected excitement, the man will turn to every kind of perversion. End quote. Kalantai goes on to discuss the many facets of love, calling it a complex state of mind and body that has been disconnected from its biological instinct toward reproduction. There is love between friends, love between a parent and a child, romantic love, love for one's work or a just cause, etc. In today's society, love has many contradictions within it, and as such, she points out just how much is included in the concept of love. It is so complex, and we mean so many different things by the word love that bourgeois thinkers and artists have long struggled with it in their works. Kalantai says that the key to this long-standing human problem is now in the hands of the proletariat, and only this class, conscious of itself as such, can begin to unravel this complex problem. Kalantai goes on at length, quote, Dramas and conflicts begin only where the various shades and manifestations of love are present. A woman feels close to a man whose ideas, hopes, and aspirations match her own. She is attracted physically to another. For one woman, a man might feel sympathy and a protective tenderness, and in another, he might find support and understanding for the strivings of his intellect. To which of the two must he give his love? And why must he tear himself apart and cripple his inner self if only the possession of both types of inner bond affords the fullness of living? She goes on. Under the bourgeois system, such a division of the inner emotional world involves inevitable suffering. For thousands of years, human culture, which is based on the institution of property, has been teaching people that love is linked with the principles of property. Bourgeois ideology has insisted that love, mutual love, gives the right to the absolute and indivisible possession of the beloved person. Such exclusiveness was the natural consequence of the establishment form of pair marriage and of the ideal of all-embracing love between husband and wife. But can such an ideal correspond to the interests of the working class? Surely it is important and desirable from the proletariat's point of view that people's emotions should develop a wider and richer range. And surely the complexity of the human psyche and the many-sidedness of emotional experience should assist in the growth of the emotional and intellectual bonds between people which make up the collective and make it stronger. The more numerous these inner threads drawing people together, the firmer the sense of solidarity and the simpler the realization of the working class ideal of comradeship and unity. End quote. She argues that, Unlike the bourgeoisie, the proletariat isn't filled with moral indignation at the many forms of winged arrows, but rather attempts to channel them in productive ways for the construction of a communist society. The complexity and nuances and difficulties of love as such is not in conflict with the interests of the proletariat as it so often has been with the bourgeoisie. In fact, it can help facilitate the development of the love-comradeship ideal. Quote, Bourgeois ideology demanded that a person should only display such qualities as sensitivity, responsiveness, and the desire to help others in their relationship with one partner. The aim of proletarian ideology is that men and women should develop these qualities not only in relation to the chosen one, but in relation to all the members of the collective. The proletarian class is not concerned as to which shades and nuances of feeling predominate in winged arrows. The only stipulation is that these emotions facilitate the development and strengthening of comradeship. The ideal of love-comradeship, which is being forged by proletarian ideology to replace the all-embracing and exclusive marital love of bourgeois culture, involves the recognition of the rights and integrity of the other's personality, a steadfast mutual support and sensitive sympathy and responsiveness to the other's needs. She goes on. The ideal of love-comradeship 
is necessary to the proletariat in the important and difficult period of the struggle for and the consolidation of the dictatorship of the proletariat. But there is no doubt that with the realization of communist society, love will acquire a transformed and unprecedented aspect. By that time, the sympathetic ties between all the members of the new society will have grown and strengthened. Love potential will have increased, and love solidarity will become the lever that competition and self-love were in the bourgeois system. Collectivism of spirit can then defeat individualist self-sufficiency and the, quote, cold of inner loneliness from which people in bourgeois culture have attempted to escape through love and marriage. The many threads bringing men and women into close emotional and intellectual contact will develop, and feelings will emerge from the private into the public sphere. Inequality between the sexes and the dependence of women on men will disappear without trace leaving only a fading memory of past ages, end quote. In this profound passage, Kalantai is lying out her conception of love comradeship, a sense of love, of care, of sensitivity to the other, no longer confined to one partner or to one family unit, but instead radically expanded to the public sphere, to one's comrades, community members, and society at large. Ultimately, one hopes, to one's entire species, and possibly beyond. Love solidarity, as she calls it, will replace the hyper-competition, consumerist self-expression, and overall self-obsession that has blossomed so grotesquely under bourgeois class rule. Communalism would flourish and tear down the walls between people, between families, between communities. With a broader and more responsive sense of community, a person can develop many relationships of many different types, no longer economically or socially confined to one person or one small set of people. Child rearing, elderly care, domestic responsibilities, and more would begin to be shared by the many, breaking people out of their isolation, their lonely suburban existences, their inequalities, their atomization. This truly is a beautiful vision of what could be, what must be, if humanity is to continue to evolve and develop. Kalantai puts an exclamation mark on this idea when she says, quote, In the new and collective society where interpersonal relations develop against a background of joyful unity and comradeship, Eros will occupy an honorable place as an emotional experience multiplying human happiness. What will be the nature of this transformed Eros? Not even the boldest fantasy is capable of providing the answer to this question. But one thing is clear. The stronger the intellectual and emotional bonds of the new humanity, the less room there is for love in the present sense of the word. Modern love always sins because it absorbs the thoughts and feelings of loving hearts and isolates the loving pair from the collective. In the future society, such a separation will not only become superfluous, but also psychologically inconceivable. In the new world, the accepted norm of sexual relations will probably be based on free, healthy, and natural attraction, without distortions and excesses, and on transformed eros. End quote. So it's important in this context to remember that above and beyond the concept of free love where all sexual encounters are just shallow and casual, she's, she's talking about something much deeper, much more profound, and a world in which you could have certain sorts of relationships with individual people, but those relationships would not no longer be isolated to just your relationship in a house by yourself, but what would be in the context of an interdependent collective and communal whole, and that would actually make those relationships much more fruitful and much more rewarding for all involved, much less constraining as well. But after this, she brings us back to the present. And she says that right now we stand between two cultures. We stand at a crossroads or a turning point between the old rotten bourgeois world and the promises of a future proletarian one. It is in this context that she behooves us as proletarians to quickly accumulate sympathetic feelings to try and actively cultivate this communal vision of love comradeship in our hearts and organizing spaces. And in order to do this, three basic principles must be followed. 1. Equality in relationships and an end to masculine egoism and the slavish suppression of the female personality. 
So in other words, she is saying, dismantle your ego and get rid of machismo. Treat one another as true equals, not as commodities or as a mere means to your sexual and emotional ends or as one of your possessions. As Kalantai says elsewhere, a quote that I think is really important and speaks to this idea, she says, quote, A man who buys the favors of a woman does not see her as a comrade or as a person with equal rights. He sees her as an unequal creature of a lower order who is of less worth. The contempt he has for her affects his attitude to all women, end quote. In other words, there will be no buying and selling of each other under communism. Two, mutual recognition of the rights of the other, of the fact that one does not own the heart and soul of the other in the sense of property encouraged by bourgeois culture. So in other words, you know, she's talking about this, this thing that often manifests in relationships as possessiveness, right? And, and we're all sort of guilty of this, most of us anyway, at certain points in our romantic development where, you know, one feels that one owns the other person sexually, emotionally, and romantically. To be in a relationship me, with me means that I'm exclusively in possession of your sexuality and your emotional life, etc., um, and, and this concept of possessiveness and the resulting jealousy and rage are products of capitalism. They're extensions of the logic of private property and of the isolating factors of, of bourgeois marital life. To see somebody as a full human being, which is a prerequisite, you know, which is what she's pointing out as necessary for love comradeship, it means to no longer see them as your exclusive property. Now, the way this can manifest is, is many different ways. And I alluded a little earlier that, that none of this is meaning, you know, everybody just can do whatever they want or that's, that's like a free love hippie orgy, right? It's, it's that these relationships can be built. You can have like, you might be connected to somebody through intellectual endeavors and that might turn into a sexual and romantic relationship, but it no longer has this sense that you own that person forever and ever and they can no longer have any meaningful relationships, even romantic ones with other people. The details of how this would work out are still something that are to be figured out in practice and not something that we can fully flesh out here. But the idea that I think is important in, in number two is this idea that the, that, that the other person is not, a, is not your possession. It's not your private property and shouldn't be treated as such. And I think that that's interesting. So let's move on to number three. This is the last one of these basic principles. Kalantai says, Comradely sensitivity the ability to listen and understand the inner workings of the loved person. Bourgeois culture demanded this only from women. So this is a challenge, I think, to men specifically, to cultivate our own sensitivity towards others, to be able to be vulnerable, to listen and be receptive to the needs of other human beings, to sort of soften ourselves and our approach to our comrades and to other human beings, to be gentle and to be loving. And historically, this has been expected of women, but not for men. And that has not only deformed our relationships and our society at large and exacerbated patriarchy, but in many cases, it's deformed and reduced severely the personalities of countless men. We all know them. Uh, these stunted men who, in a million different ways, seem to stop at a certain point of human development. They... Uh, maybe are scared of their own emotionality. They channel their sorrow and pain into rage and they lash out against others. They are violent with other people. Um, you know, those who pretend that all of this is actually synonymous with healthy masculinity, a sort of trembling machismo which tries to cover up its own insecurity by presenting itself as the peak of masculinity always trying to prove itself as masculine and thus betraying the insecurity at the root of it. This sort of person, this sort of, of man, this conception of masculinity, I think she's saying this must be transcended socially and individually. So those are the three basic principles. Um, and then, you know, Colin Ty ends this section and this entire essay by anticipating and responding to a possible critique, which in my view highlights her appreciation for contradiction and the open-ended experimental nature of dialectical unfoldings. She says, quote, But I can hear you objecting, my young friend, that though it may be true that love comradeship will become the ideal of the working class, 
Will this new moral measurement of emotions not place new constraints on sexual relationships? Are we not liberating love from the fetters of bourgeois morality only to enslave it once again? Yes, my young friend, you are right. The ideology of the proletariat rejects bourgeois morality in the sphere of love-marriage relations. Nevertheless, it inevitably develops its own class morality, its own rules of behavior, which correspond more closely to the tasks of the working class and educate the emotions in a certain direction. In this way, it could be said that feelings are once again in chains. The proletariat will undoubtedly clip the wings of bourgeois culture, but it would be short-sighted to regret this process since the new class is capable of developing new facets of emotion which possess unprecedented beauty, strength, and radiance. As the cultural and economic base of humanity changes, so too will love be transformed. She goes on, The blind, all-embracing, demanding passions will weaken. The sense of property, the egotistical desire to bind the partner to one forever, the complacency of the man and the self-renunciation of the woman will disappear. At the same time, the valuable aspects and elements of love will develop. Respect for the right of the other's personality will increase, and a mutual sensitivity will be learned. Men and women will strive to express their love not only in kisses and embraces, but in joint creativity and activity. The task of proletarian ideology is not to drive Eros from social life, but to rearm him according to the new social formation and to educate sexual relationships in the spirit of the great new psychological force of comradely solidarity. I hope it is now clear to you that the interest among young workers in the question of love is not a symptom of decline. I hope that you can now grasp the place love must occupy in the relationships between young workers. End quote. And with that, Kalantai ends her essay, Make Way for Winged Eros. Okay, so now with part one out of the way in which we summarized both of these articles in depth, we're moving to part two, our discussion section. And the first question is a question I'll ask Allison. And it's it's blunt, but it's important, and I think it's going to open up a lot of interesting conversation. And that is the question, was Kalantai anti-feminist? How do we understand Kalantai's ideas in relation to contemporary feminism? Yeah, so this is a question that I think we have to wrestle with because there's a lazy way of reading Cole and I um, that might try to um, treat this somewhat reductively. So especially in the first text that we talked about, but throughout Cole and I's writing, you see the term feminist used as a pejorative, right? So it's used kind of in the negative. The connotation is not positive at all. It's often an insult. And so from this, there are certain people who I would consider to be taking a very chauvinist stance who uh, kind of adopts the position that Kolontai was anti-feminist and that, you know, we should use Kolontai as an argument against feminism primarily. And I think that this is something that we need to kind of push back against and also wrestle with the specificity of what Kolontai is getting at in these texts. So I think one thing to be very clear is that when we're dealing with historical texts, we can't just assume that terminology can be literally applied today as it was in the past, right? So when Kolontai is speaking of feminism, especially in on the social, uh, social basis of the women question, in 1909, she's talking about a very specific movement, right? And is largely this movement for women to gain political rights through reform within bourgeois society. And that movement is not the same thing as the hundred years of feminist theory and praxis that we've had since then. So we need to wrestle with these things. We can't just assume that we can take, you know, the word feminist as used in Kolontai literally and apply it here today. That would be, I think, very ahistorical, although there are people that want to do it. Like I said, there's been easily a hundred years of feminist theorizing since then, and some of that has been honestly very bad, and some of it has been very useful, and we have to deal with those things complexly, and I think Kolontai gives us some of the skills to do so. Um, our episode on philosophical trends in the feminist movement gets into kind of the nitty-gritty of the good and bad that's going on there, 
But I think what's clear is that feminism in the time period since Colin Tai wrote has moved in multiple directions. You have, of course, had postmodernist approaches, you've had bourgeois radical feminist approaches, but you've also had proletarian approaches that take seriously the experiences of working women and understand women's oppression through the context of class. And these approaches often sound very similar to and draw extensively on what Colin Tai is doing in the various texts that she wrote. So, although Colin Tai uses feminism um, as a pejorative, she's talking about the specific group, and feminists have in fact employed Colin Tai's work to kind of create a Marxist approach to questions of gender and sex, which is feminist in orientation, but is also proletarian in orientation. And I think that's important for us to think about. I think what's also clear from Colin Tai's writing and from her life as well is that she didn't believe that the revolution would just magically resolve the oppression of women all on its own, right? It's not we will have the proletarian revolution and then women's oppression just magically disappears. She understood the revolution, and this is very clear throughout these texts, as a prerequisite, but it's not sufficient. It had to be guided in such a way that women's liberation could also be achieved. And this is why her participation in the women's department, for example, was so important for her. It was the application of these ideas. When the revolution occurred, Heard, there had to be an active organizational effort to address literacy for women, to address abortion rights for women in the USSR. And we saw Colin Tai fight actively for these things that were specifically articulated as women's issues. So given that, I think that it's very clear that Colin Tai's claim isn't that we should ignore the needs of women or ignore an analysis of women's needs as particular or unique. It's that these needs can't supplant class and that we can't understand or address these needs until we've understood and addressed the reality of class and private property. And so that means that whatever kind of analysis of, uh, you know, women and gender that we get out of Colin Tai's work is very proletarian in its orientation, obviously. And so in this sense, I think that Colin Tai would actually seem to orient towards something that we might call feminism, right? This idea that we need to take the specificity of women's experiences and of gendered experiences very, very seriously. But it's not a kind of universalist liberal feminism that assumes that all women have the same interests, right? It's a feminism that starts with the interests of proletarian women. And in that sense, it's very in line with the concept of proletarian feminism that has been put forward by various Maoists like Honorata Gandhi, for example, where we focus on the needs of proletarian women in particular in order to understand how that could liberate women from conditions of oppression which result from class, which result from private property, which result from family relations that are a product of capitalism. So is Colin Tai anti-feminist? I think no. She was opposed to the feminism of her time. But if we think about all the developments of feminism since then, especially the developments put forward by Marxists and Maoists in particular, it's very clear that Colin Tai's work is not only in line with it, but often an inspiration for those ideals. So I don't think that we can just treat Colin Tai as easily anti-feminist as some chauvinists want to do on the basis of her using feminism as a pejorative. We need to think historically, not ahistorically, and kind of wrestle with how things have changed and what legacies are in place since then. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. And I think there's an interesting parallel with like, you know, social Democrats trying to nitpick elements of Lenin to say that Lenin, you know, was more or less on their side against a more revolutionary Marxism, etc. It's like if you just take these words as these static things and try to apply them without doing the, the historical work and the context around it, you can be easily misled. And like, you know, Colin Tai's legacy is not just in the realm of ideas or, or in the realm of being a politician within the Soviet Union, but like things like child care and daycare, which are almost taken for granted around the world, were really theorized and pushed forward and implemented as policies by her in her role as a politician. She also did things like, you know, defend and advance abortion rights within the Soviet Union, etc., um, so yeah, to, to say that she, she is anti-feminist, I think totally misses the point. And there's this wonderful quote that she, she says that I think gets at, at Allison's point really well. Uh, Colin Tai says, so long as the bourgeois women and their proletarian younger sisters are equal in their inequality, the former can, with complete sincerity, make great efforts to defend the general interests of women. But once the barrier is down and the bourgeois women have received access to political activity, the recent defenders of the rights of all women become enthusiastic defenders of the privileges of their class. And that's, I think, getting at this, this critique and implementing a class analysis into 
um, the, a critique of bourgeois feminism and an advancement of a very specific proletarian feminism. Um, so yeah, really great points. And it's also important to, to, to know that she was not only arguing against bourgeois feminists and, you know, sort of positioning her, her ideas within this broader sort of bourgeois and reactionary world and culture, but also there's many Bolshevik men and, and comrades who didn't take these ideas seriously, couldn't quite understand them, straw manned them after the fact, etc. And so, you know, she's really heroic on for multiple reasons, including the fact that there's internal and external sort of pressures being put on her as a thinker in this direction. So that should just make us, you know, take take her even more seriously and ad, admire her even more. But I, I want to move on, and I don't really have a specific question for Allison to ask me. I have some points I want to sort of make and and, and talk about and, and maybe get Allison's perspective on them as well. One of the things that I think is really important about specifically the, the Make Way for a Winged Arrows essay that I that I did and, and of her work more broadly is this um, envisioning of a future, this dangerous, sometimes volatile work of trying to envision what life could be like under a different future mode of production and set of social relations. So some Marxists, you know, will get really bogged down in, in just doing material analysis of the present or, or of the his, of, of history of the past. Um, but the, the boldness of envisioning a future and trying to outline what a future society could look like and what the tasks are, uh, I think is really bold and, and courageous and important. And, you know, looking back historically, when somebody attempts to do this, it's very hard to get it right. So to, to, to go out on a limb and try to do this um, will almost always mean that you'll get some things very wrong. Um, but she does a wonderful job of, of envisioning that future. And I think today we can learn from, from Colin Ty's example and, and other Marxists' example from the past who dared to present a vision of how things could be, not just a critique of how things are. That critique is utterly important, but if it's never, ever paired with a vision of how things could be, um, sometimes it can be dispiriting and discouraging to people. It's like it's just this endless parade of why things are fucked up, um, but never any <laughs> gesture towards how these problems could be solved and overcome. And particularly with uh, the intensity of climate change bearing down on us, it's more and more important that we can articulate a vision of the future on multiple fronts, uh, including the realm of the romantic and of love and of friendship, etc. And I also wanted to, to talk about in in the in the Eros essay, Colin Ty talks about the Russian Civil War being a time of in, intensity where people could not give the emotional energy and time to forming relationships, pursuing love, etc. And I think we live in you know her point there is like in times of certain social conditions and crises, other things that make us human fall to the wayside almost by necessity or are sort of prohibited from giving our full attention and time to. And I think in our own society, in late capitalism, in this brutal neoliberal era of precarity, of the gig economy, of working multiple jobs, there's this epidemic of loneliness, um, not even to talk about romantic relationships, but even just friendships are harder and harder to come by, to develop, to sustain. And so, you know, we're, while we're not in an explicit acute civil war, as it were, um, we are in a crisis period where we can clearly see how that crisis limits what we're able to do in these other spheres of our life. And so I think even though she's talking about an event over 100 years ago, in her essay, lots of those elements are alive and well and leading to directly causing so much unnecessary suffering in, in human beings that are forced to live it at this period of time. Another point that she made, and I'll just make two more and then I'll toss it over to Allison. You, Allison, you can pick up on whatever thread I laid down totally. here. Totally. Um, this wonderful point she makes in the third section called Love Conradship in her Eros essay about the, the connection between love and solidarity. And she says, she opens that section by saying, quote, The new communist society is being built on the principle of comradeship and solidarity. Solidarity is not only an awareness of common interests, it depends also on the intellectual and emotional ties linking the members of the collective. 
For a social system to be built on solidarity and cooperation, it is essential that people should be capable of love and warm emotions. The proletarian ideology, therefore, attempts to educate and encourage every member of the working class to be capable of responding to the distress and needs of other members of the class, of a sensitive understanding of others, and a penetrating consciousness of the individual's relationship to the collective. All these warm emotions, sensitivity, compassion, sympathy, and responsiveness, derive from one source. They are aspects of love not in the narrow sexual sense, but in the broad meaning of the word. Love is an emotion that unites and is consequently of an organizing character. Uh, and, and she goes on, um, and, and you can hear that full essay on, on our Patreon where I'll read the, read the entire essay in its entirety. But I really loved this point about, you know, sometimes solidarity can be expressed in, in a rather shallow way, or sometimes it can be reduced to, well, it just means that we have this, the same basic material interests. But I think it's really important to tie this sense of love and, and comradely nature in the sense that my well-being and my future and my happiness and my health are inexorably tied up with those around me and those around the entire world. And to develop this sense of solidarity that's rooted in this love for the other, I think, is, is really promising. And I almost never hear that sort of discussion from Marxists more broadly. And, and in a capitalist society, the opposite is true. We are we are taught and conditioned to recoil from from the suffering of others, to recoil into our little family unit, to, you know, me and mine, and to view the tragedies and pitfalls of others not as something that I need to come to the aid of or I need to act in compassionate action to alleviate that suffering, but I could just see that and say, I don't want it to happen to me. How do I prevent that from happening right. to me? Um, and and that disconnects us from our own humanity, from one another, and it feeds into the pathologies of capitalism, which is leading our species and the biosphere itself um, to the absolute brink. And so I, I really thought that was interesting and worth cultivating and thinking about in our organizational circles, in our political education work, and and in mutual aid and everything that, that the left does, trying to link these ideas up. And then the last thing I want to put on the table is this idea of Kalantai tracks in a historical materialist fashion the role of sexuality, of love and emotions and relationships through ancient uh, you know, city-states to feudalism to capitalism and shows how these things shift and change due to the incentive structures of these different mode of productions and social relations. And I look at today in late capitalism, certainly in, in, in the West or in the U.S., we haven't shifted to a new mode of production. If anything, the capitalist mode of production has just deeply entrenched itself. And yet we are seeing hints of new forms of sexual, of sexuality, of gender expression, of different types of relationships. And I'm kind of struggling to, to make sense of, of what that means. Are these just manifestations of a particular epoch of capitalist, late capitalist development? Or are there seeds within these new forms of being that hint at a possible socialist future? Like, you know, what is the meaning of, of some of these things? Um, I have, like, for example, nieces and my daughter, and, and they're, they're entering their teenage years. And they have friends that openly identify as trans or as non-binary. Um, multiple of their friends identify as bisexual or gay. And it is just taken for granted that that is right. com like, it's completely normal and they can't even fathom these things being controversial or worth arguing about. And just in a generation, you see a pretty radical shift. And I'm not exactly sure what to make of it. Um, and I was wondering, Allison, if, if you had any thoughts on that or any anything else that I laid out on the table. Yeah. So I, I'm going to start with kind of the idea of like being willing to envision a future a little bit, because I think historicizing why this text is that way is really interesting. So in the first text that we read, right, uh, the social basis of the woman question, we don't see this kind of speculation. It's more like you were saying, Brett, the kind of like, let's critique the status quo, um, very like focused on what's wrong with the movement at hand, and really an argument at the end a little bit against like getting too out of control trying to imagine new ways of living right she talks about the heroic bourgeois feminists who think they can like live their lives in rebellion and that that's enough and why these new ways of trying to live out new kinship under capitalism aren't actually a revolution in and of themselves 
But when we get to the second text to make way for winged arrows, something interesting is happening, which is that we're writing this after the Russian Revolution. And the text is also written in uh, 1923, so coming out of the Russian Civil War. And this is like an interesting moment to write, because most communist literature that we're reading is written at a time where we're not the victors, right? Um, that is, I think, a very big part of why it is the way it is. But at this moment that Kolontai writes this text, the Soviets are winning. They are in a position of power and are able to imagine. And so we do see from that moment her kind of set aside her own reservations that she had expressed before the revolution about trying to envision these new projects of kinship and relationship and sexuality and saying, actually, no, now is the time that we can finally get to do that. And I think that that, you know, if nothing else, makes this text really interesting, because we just don't see communist literature like that a lot. But I also think it's worth reading because we need to be reminded that, like, we're fighting for something, right? I think that as Marxists, you know, we have this emphasis on the scientificity of our ideas, and sometimes, like, what are you fighting for? Well, the abstract rupture of this contradiction between socialized labor and private property. And, like, yes, that is kind of what we're fighting for, but what does that mean? Right? What does that look like for us personally? What does that look like emotionally and subjectively? We often lose those things. And I think in this text, we see someone who is a scientific socialist, who clearly is not scared to back off of cutting and ruthless critique, take a second and just kind of imagine what we could be building. And I think that quotation that you read in particular that gets at solidarity as an emotional experience as well, an experience of love and all these various other aspects of love is really important because I think that it reminds us we are trying to build a world that isn't just an abstract resolution of dialectical contradictions. It is a world where human sociality can have meaning, can be set free from property and capital, and where beautiful ways of living that we have been denied and that we as people deserve can actually emerge. And we just, I think, really lose sight of that a lot. And so I think it's important that Colin Ty spends time envisioning this here and can help us recenter. You know, I'm reminded also, of course, of that infamous Che quote about love as well, right? Many revolutionaries have focused on the need to be motivated from it. But I think what's interesting here is it's not just the need to be motivated by love, but the idea that a solidarity society could be structured by love. It's the kind of thought that you don't hear communists talk about very much when we talk about what communism and socialism might mean, and I think that it's very interesting to wrestle with. Um, I also think this question that you sort of end on, on the relevance of new forms of sexuality and gender expression, is really interesting. Because like you, I'm kind of shocked by the younger generation a little bit, I think. Um, you know, from my generation, being queer, being trans, being gay, that was a huge deal, right? Um, it required a you know, process of coming out, there were often social consequences for it, and from generations before ours, there were even greater consequences. So, you know, these things have shifted. But it is true when I look at a lot of these younger uh, students that we have in middle school and high school today, they take these things for granted in a way that is, like, really fascinating, um, and where, you know, I've heard people express, like, I didn't feel the need to come out. A lot of my friends are gay, a lot of my friends are trans, there's no, like, moment of, like, revealing something like that. So these social shifts, I think, are really interesting to track. Um, in terms of what do they mean, I think that's the harder part to wrestle with, right? I think that there's a tendency among more radical-leaning liberals to want to see these shifts as revolutionary in and of themselves. And I do think we need to push back against that. I think Colin Ty gives us some of the reasons that we might want to push back against that. Namely, that as long as regimes of private property exist, whatever new forms of relations and sexuality emerge are still going to be under a dictatorship of capital, and are still going to be utilized and controlled by that dictatorship of capital in various ways. So, on the one hand, you have the obvious commodification of LGBT identity, the way that pride has been commodified, but you also have the really increasing pinkwashing of imperialism that happens where, you know, the in the recent conflicts that we saw regarding Israel and Palestine, even these ideas got trotted out of Israel's the most gay-friendly country in the Middle East, right? Hamas hates gay people, and so these things will still be used by capitalism. So we can't understand them as revolutionary in and of themselves, and I think it's important to understand that. And again, I think Kolontai is making a critique of the idea that any sort of lifestyle could be revolutionary in and of itself. But 
and I think it's important to moderate this. At the same time, the fact that this is emerging, I think, shows a strain on the capitalist system to a certain extent. Kolontai and Engels both have done exceptional work showing how, like, the heterosexual nuclear family was central to capitalism, right? And that family is kind of fraying, and we are seeing a move away from that structure with the emergence of LGBT identity, new forms of gender expression that push back against that. And I do think that even if we can't see those identities or those expressions as inherently radical or revolutionary, that doesn't mean they don't express kind of this innate, perhaps, human desire to get beyond these forms of life imposed on us by capitalism. And they can't do that merely by existing, of course. That can only happen through proletarian rule, through organization around proletarian interests that would get rid of the class dynamics that would appropriate these identities for the ends of capital. But they do express a yearning that is there, that is becoming more and more clear, not coincidentally, as capitalism begins to fracture and hit more intense points of crises. You know, the... Right, of course, will point to this and say, like, look, this is more social degeneracy. It's social decay. And there is a sense in which it is a result of social decay, but not in a negative sense, right? The fact that capitalism is fracturing, perhaps, has opened the possibility for new forms of human relation that, again, can't be fully liberatory in and of themselves, but can point towards the need for something outside of capitalism. And that's kind of how I would tend to view that question, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I knew you'd have a, a great analysis of, of that question, and that's why I, I tossed it your way. And I think you hit the nail on the head in, in multiple different ways. And, you know, I, I thought of that question in part because as I'm going through the Eros essay, it's it's very clear that, and, you know, just historical materialism more broadly, it's not like there are these overnight shifts where feudalism comes to an end and capitalism begins but it is this long protracted period of a rising new class, a rising new social order, and these two things sort of bleed into one another. And even today, we see remnants, residue of the feudal order, let's say in like the British royal family and, and how marriage is done and the controversies around the royal family and who the princes are marrying and what social strata that those those people come from, et cetera. So and we, it's corny and it's hilarious and we all mock it, but it continues to live on well into late capitalism. And so the reverse is also true where these germs of something new are like, you know, like, like weeds popping up through the concrete, sort of expressing themselves in limited ways. And then they're co-opted and turned towards the dominant, you know, sort of systems interests, but still are sort of in their own right, pushing against the, the the normativities of that society and at least have within them the promises, the seeds of something different that could flourish and blossom completely in a new social and political and economic context. Um, so, so just not having that really strict mechanical idea of how systems turn into the other, but to, to find the points at which they begin bleeding into one another from both sides, I think is particularly interesting. And I think your analysis really gets at that and then the the last thing I would say before we before we move on, or if you have any last last words on this on this uh, part, I would just say that the idea of us being conditioned against loving or caring about strangers or the other, us being hyper self concerned with us and ours, and seeing other people more as a threat than as like uh, somebody you can link up with and pursue common goals with, um, and then trying to overcome that, I think that is where certain spiritual practices can come into play because. You know, I like like the ability to love somebody, you're conditioned not to not to necessarily develop that capacity, but it's it's within you and importantly, and this is the point I want to make, it can be purposefully and consciously cultivated. Um and, and there are spiritual practices specifically within Buddhism, which I'm most familiar with, in which love of the other, love of complete and total strangers is something that is consciously cultivated within a certain sort of meditative practice. That then goes on to, over time, uh, open up your your heart in a way that is anathema to your capitalist bourgeois programming, and that really allows you to feel the suffering of other beings, even those that are as different from you as a human could possibly be, as something you are invested in, as something that you cannot turn away from. And I think within those practices, it holds the the ability for us to consciously cultivate to cultivate that and develop that as we are fighting on the external political, economic, and social 
terrain to transform all of those systems in, in that direction as well. So I just wanted to, to put that out there and, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and I think it, it's worth saying now at the moment that we are in, it's important to cultivate that kind of love and solidarity because, you know, it, it's hard to express the extent to which the United States is on the precipice of a huge crisis, right? And I think that homelessness is an example where we can think about this seeing others suffering as a threat, right? So how do people in the U.S. respond to homelessness largely? Well, it's with revulsion. It's with a sense of disgust. It's with a wanting to get it away. And yet, as soon as this eviction moratorium goes away, right? Um, tens of millions of people are potentially going to find themselves in that situation that they have been trying to hide from this entire time. And I think that at a moment like this, it's so crucial that we be able to create these forms of solidarity and say, look, no, the experiences of you who are in this apartment and the person sleeping on the street corner are not that far apart, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, in fact, are both living in the same economic system. Both have been hurt and exploited by the same economic system. And you could become that at any single moment. And in fact, we are going to see a flashpoint of that. So when we're on the verge of that kind of crisis, it's going to be more important than ever to be able to see the suffering of others, which is about to balloon at a mass scale as soon as these evictions start to happen, not as something to run from, but as a source of love and solidarity and unity to fight back against the thing which caused it. So I do think that this isn't just sort of an abstract emotive idea. In terms of the specific crisis that we're in right now, it is a crucial idea. Yeah, and, and seeing yourself in your life uh, as a hyper individual, the opposite of that is, is seeing yourself in your life as embedded in an interdependent web of being. Um, and that is, I think, the main thing that like the, the crisis of climate change specifically, but other crises as well, is pushing on us. Like you cannot... You cannot have a global civilization of a bunch of individuals fighting for their own individual interests. You have to grow up as a species and as, as a civilization and understand that your entire future, your everything that you care about is in, inexorably and intimately interwoven with those around you, those across the world from you, and the, uh, the broader ecological system in which you are utterly embedded and dependent upon. And it is forcing that upon us, and then humanity has a choice. Do we maintain this mode of production, these social relations, this hyper-individualism, competition, profit motive, and literally drive our species into a mass extinction event and a, and, a, and a civilizational collapse of barbarism and fascism and nuclear war? Or do we radically wake up, evolve to the next stage of, of human growth, cultural development, and do do things in a brand new way that is more rational, rational, more sustainable, more egalitarian, and more healthy for us as individuals and as as a as a civilization, as a collective. Um, and that is increasingly the sort of conundrum being laid at our feet. And nature, in so many ways, is saying, choose one. Yeah, and it's not a choice anyone wants to make, but I think we are clearly, and the pandemic proves this in addition to global warming, mm -hmm. right? What is the pandemic if not the danger of that interconnectedness laid raw in a certain extent? But we don't have a choice about it. And so cultivating these forms of care and love are really kind of the only option that we have because where the world's going, you're not going to make it if you're on your own. Exactly. All right. Well, that wraps up the discussion section of this episode. And I think now we're ready to move into the application section. So for my application point today, I think that there's one lesson I really want to focus on in Colin Tai's work, which is how she can help us think about the relationship between class and identity. And I think this is an important question to wrestle with. And it's something that I feel like Marxists often get wrong, either falling into a chauvinist position or a liberal position. And I think we should work through it a little bit. It was Lenin who famously wrote in What is to be Done that the party ought to be a party which unites all the progressive classes and peoples under proletarian politics. And this means that within communist organizing, the proletariat is given primacy as the class which expresses the universal interests of all oppressed people, but it also means that communism is a movement of unity between different peoples. And this idea has created uh, what is admittedly an extremely fine line for Marxists to walk. On the one hand, we have to insist on the utter primacy of proletarian politics. And this is a result of the Marxist insight that class is, at its core, a matter of relations to production and property. This relation expresses a core and central contradiction within capitalism between socialized labor and individual ownership and profit. 
the proletariat are uniquely positioned to agitate around this contradiction and to rupture it uh, through the universalization of social labor and the overthrow of the capitalist regime of private ownership. And these are really central ideas to Marxism. On the other hand, we also have to emphasize the degree to which the goal of proletarian rule is in the universal interest of humanity. The proletariat may be only a part of the population, but the overthrow of capitalism would abolish both the proletariat and the capitalist class, leading to the conditions for actual solidarity between people undivided by class. And as such, proletarian rule is in the interests of all people to certain degrees. Even the bourgeoisie would be freed from the constant crisis of capitalism that plagues their rule, though they've rarely seen this as fair compensation for the loss of power. And I think Kolontai also hits at this too, right? She does note that capitalism is terrible to bourgeois women and that the liberation of the bourgeois women themselves could only occur through the end of capitalism and the establishment of socialism. It's not that these women wouldn't be benefited in some ways through getting rid of capitalism, it's that their more immediate economic self-interest forces them obviously into solidarity with their bourgeois class. So, what does all this have to do with identity, though, and with Kollontai? Well, Marxists have long struggled to articulate exactly how our goal of proletarian dictatorship relates to other questions of identity, such as gender-based oppression. Kollontai, I think, models the correct answer to this problem very well, and I think we should really focus on kind of the formal response that she makes here. She doesn't reject the idea that the experiences of women are important to emphasize, or that there may be unique ways in which women face oppression and exploitation on the basis of womanhood. Quite the opposite, she's extremely capable of recognizing these things. She refers throughout the text to the particular subjugation of women, the particular exploitation of women, and she does even note that bourgeois women and proletarian women are both hurt extremely by a double burden that is imposed by the family and through male domination in various ways. So it's not like these things don't exist. That's not really what her position is. But at the same time, she rejects the idea that these experiences are wholly separate from the question of capitalism and class. Her frustration with the feminist movement of her time, she says quite explicitly in her introduction, is that even though it is the communists who are the only ones who have made a programmatic focus on women's emancipation, these bourgeois reformers don't want to join them. And the frustration there is very much that they're not interested in uniting with the progressive elements within the communist organizations of the time. And she insists that if we actually want to take these experiences seriously, like if we think that women do experience these unique forms of exploitation and oppression, then that's all the more reason that we have to reject solidarity with the bourgeoisie and we have to unite under some form of proletarian leadership. And this isn't because the experiences of women are negligible or should be downplayed, and quite the contrary, it's because they can only be given proper attention when they're addressed alongside class, because the conditions which produce the family, the conditions which produce women's exploitation in various ways, are the conditions of capitalism themselves. They are the conditions of property. Kolontai tells us that even our experiences of love and a kinship with others are shaped through regimes of property, so these more progressive ways of escaping this kind of control couldn't exist absent getting rid of class society. It is not so much that Kolontai is opposed to feminist notions of free love, for example, so much as she recognizes that free love is impossible and maybe even dangerous, absent proletarian rule and the abolition of class society. And so Kolontai ends up not so much rejecting the particularity of women's experience, but rather ends up emphasizing the inseparability of these experiences from class and insists on the necessity of uniting uh, to deal with these experiences under proletarian political leadership. So it would be possible, I think, on the one hand, for people to try to argue that this is class reductionism, right? saying this is all just class and saying that nothing else matters. But that is not quite the case, right? Because Kollontai's position isn't that the oppression of women can be boiled down to just class. It's that it can't be addressed without addressing class, and that the conditions which produce it are conditions which can only be overcome through overcoming class. That doesn't mean that women workers don't face different forms of oppression than male workers, and in fact Kollontai is quite clear that they face this sort of double oppression. So it's not a dismissal of these ideas. It's not a chauvinist rejection of concerns for identity or differential experiences of different kinds of workers. Rather, it's a call for unity 
towards a classless society. And I think this is very interesting. And I think that this should really model the Marxist approach to questions of identity and differential experience for us. The proper stance is not to reject all notions of identity or to criticize those who call attention to it. And rather, the goal should be to demonstrate why the needs of various groups of people cannot be resolved without proletarian rule. And that's definitely a harder task, but that's the task that's at hand. The end point is not to shut down discussions of identity and differential oppression and exploitation, but it's rather to create a basis for unity and class struggle. And it doesn't mean just assuming that once capitalism is gone, all these differential experiences on the basis of race, sexuality, or gender will just disappear. They won't. They'll have to be actively struggled through, just as after the revolution, even class doesn't just disappear. There's always more struggle that needs to be ongoing, and that needs to be intentional. We can see that in Colin Tai's own life, where she worked under the women's department to try to specifically address the situations that Soviet women found themselves in. It's not just throwing our hands up and say we only care about the abstract question of proletarian revolution. No, we care about the details of it in how it relates to identity. And the end point, again, is not to shut down discussions of identity, but it's to orient those discussions towards political unity in the fight against capitalism. And this should be obvious. The interests of the proletariat are, according to Marxism, a universal interest. So, of course, the goal should be to unite both, uh, you know, the struggles against oppression, no matter its form, under proletarian politics and a proletarian party. So from my application point... I'm going to read a quick quote, comment on it, and then I'm going to play a section of my interview with Kristen Gotzi on Rev Left Radio on the life and legacy of Alexandra Kollontai episode, where Kristen Gotzi does this wonderful breakdown of one of the main lessons that we can learn from Kollontai's life and apply in our own left-wing organizing uh, spaces and our, our community of left-wing people fighting for a better world. Before we get to that little clip, though, the quote that I wanted to mention, and this harkens back to something I said earlier in this episode about the Cultural Revolution. Alexandra Kollontai says, quote, Only when the proletariat has appropriated the laws not only of the creation of material wealth, but also of inner psychological life, is it able to advance fully armed to fight the decaying bourgeois world. Only then will toiling humanity prove itself to be the victor, not only on the military and labor front, but also on the psychological, cultural front, end quote. This is wonderful in two ways. One, the idea of fighting on the psychological front is something that Kristen Godsey is about to speak on in this clip I'm going to play, and she also mentions the cultural front. Um, and this, of course, you know, in, in Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, the cultural revolution is a main pillar of of the idea of revolution and of course there are many thinkers who have gestured in that direction throughout the years on the left saying that it's not only a fight for the means of production it's not only a fight for who controls the state or whatever it's also a fight uh about our inner lives about culture about the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves, our relationship to ourselves, to one another, to the natural world. The revolution that we're seeking to to build, the better world that we're seeking to build, is a full frontal attack on all the structures of this old dying world. They all have to be overturned. And um, I think Colin Ty hints at that with this point that we also must fight on the psychological and cultural front. Now, of course, it wasn't theorized uh, in, in such depth as is the Cultural Revolution in Maoism, but like Lenin and, and figures like Che, there is this talking about the revolution is, is beyond just the political and the economic. It also is the psychological, the social, the cultural, etc. And that quote gets at that perfectly. So now I'm going to play a clip, again, as I said, um, from my discussion on Rev Left Radio with Kristen Godsey, and she makes a really important point about how we can apply Colin Ty's life and legacy to our contemporary struggles and our contemporary relationships with one another on the left. Here is that clip. What are some of the, the main lessons or inspirations that the contemporary left, Marxist, feminist, or otherwise, can take from the life and work of Alexander Colin Ty? So I think that... So there are a couple of things, and I, I, I want to read you, if I can find it, a quote. 
because I, I mean, again, like I have an entire, you know, two years worth of a podcast about yeah, exactly. her at this point. So it's like everything about her life is really fascinating. I mean, what do you want? Um, <laughs> but uh, you're asking the wrong person. But the one, but the one thing that I will say um, that I think is really important is this idea of doing the work that we need to support each other emotionally within the movement. So there is this incredible speech that she gives. Um, I'm trying to to find the exact. um, Yeah, here it is. So Emma Goldman. So John Reed was an American journalist in the Soviet Union uh, for the revolution. He's very famously the guy who wrote the book 10 Days That Shook the World. And in in 1920, Emma Goldman was in um, was in Russia, obviously, and in 1920, first Inessa Arman died quite suddenly of cholera. And then two months later, John Reed died. And uh, Emma Goldman, whose initial impression of Kolontai was that she was kind of a grand dame and not really a real revolutionary. You know, she was she was an aristocrat after all. And she was always very well dressed and everything like that. Goldman was really moved by Kolontai's speech over John Reed's grave. And um, and she reports the speech. Um, she gives an excerpt of the speech in her book. She says, this is Colin Ty, who is reflecting not only now on the death of John Reed, but also on the death of, of Armand. We call ourselves communists, but are we really that? Do we not draw the life essence from those who come to us? And when they are no longer of use, we let them fall by the wayside, neglected and forgotten. Our communism and our comradeship are dead letters. If we do not give out of ourselves to those who need us, let us beware of such communism. It slays the best in our ranks. And I just think that that really captures something about how important it is for us to not only think about getting our politics right, and, you know, especially on the left, I think we have all of these debates about the right political way or the right, you know, theoretical framework or the right practical strategy to achieve our goals. How do we build coalitions? How do we, you know, reach out to people that we might not otherwise cooperate with? How do we deal with hierarchies of race and gender and sexuality? But underlying all of those questions is the sort of basic emotional need to take care of each other. And this is why I really loved um, Jody Dean's book, this idea of comradeship. And I think a little bit we've lost that sense of, of how important it is to be comrades to each other. Um, and, that, and I think Colin Tai's life, you know, again, it's very complicated and there are many criticisms that you could address to her writings and, and her thinking. And it is, you know, hard to necessarily update somebody who was writing over a century ago to the, you know, 20 to 2021 and, and the post-pandemic world that we're about to hopefully be living in. Um, but I do think that the one essential concept is this the importance of emotional Um, support for each other in what is, as we will all recognize, a really difficult struggle. It was back then, and it remains so to this day. Capitalism is very pernicious. It's emotionally draining and exhausting to constantly be outraged against the, the injustices that we see around us in the world, and to constantly be thinking and working towards somehow rectifying those injustices. And so, Colin Tai really admonishes us to care for each other. And I think that's a really important message. Absolutely gorgeous, uh, heart-rending quote and beautifully said on your part as well. Um, and, and it's it's a perpetual problem. Um, us uh, on the left, I mean, you know, we are operating in horrific times. And there, as you said, there's so much heartbreak every single day. Um, but a, a gentle, loving reminder to be gentle with ourselves and with one another um, I think is always going to be relevant and is especially relevant in these times. And I'll have to have me and Jody have been talking about her coming back on the show. I'll have to have her on to just do a whole episode on her, on her book comrades. Um, but yeah, beautifully said.
So that concludes our exploration of the work of Colin Ty. Like we said, there are a ton of other resources that we shouted out in our introduction, including the Rev Left episode, which gets way more into depth on her life and perspective. And you should absolutely check those and make sure that you're getting as much information and context as you can, because as awesome as these texts are, it is also important for you to be able to get some of the context from which these texts emerged. Uh, we are, for Patreon this month, going to be recording both of these texts as audio files for people to have access to, since we think that it would be helpful for people to be able to listen along on these two. They're not super long. You could probably listen to them in a car ride if you needed to. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. If you are interested in that, you can check us out on Patreon. It's Patreon The Red Menace. We are also on Twitter, and uh, the Twitter aspect is going to be particularly important, because like we said in the introduction, we are going to be making our next episode a Q&A episode, where we are going to take questions not just from patrons, but also from people on Twitter. We'll get a thread uh, set up for that where you can leave your questions there. We'll make sure that it's up for enough time for everyone to get their ideas in and we'll select what we think would be productive discussion. So really come at us with whatever you got. Any interesting questions, especially ones clarifying our uh, sort of takes on the text that we've covered before would be deeply appreciated and we'll go ahead and get to answering those. Thank you so much for all your continued support and for listening. It really does mean quite a lot to both Brett and I and we hope that you've enjoyed this episode and found it very helpful. Solidarity. (laughs) 